Okay, we're recording. Okay. Uh, it's wrong speed, record chat number 54. We have Mr. J.R. Moores. I should have asked before we started, do I call you J.R.? Or... Uh, well, that's a good question, isn't it? J, J, so I caught, do you want the long story? Yes. About my identity? Yes. Um, <laughs> basically, in real life, I'm John. Uh, most people call me John. Um, John Moores is, as people will know, also a university in Liverpool. Um, so to not kind of get confused by that, when I first started writing without any um, ambitions to do it professionally. I just went with my initials, J.R. Moores, um, which also was quite a useful tool in um, in kind of pushing myself to be, to be more opinionated in a way. J.R. is like is almost like a character sometimes in my mind when I'm writing. You know, jo John listens to the dreadful new idols album and thinks that's not my cup of tea moves on with his life whereas jr gets really angry about it and writes a thousand words for the quietus um about you know that kind of thing that, uh, that was yeah. fun well yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was it was it was a fun few it was a fun week on twitter that yeah <laughs> yeah twitter can really it can really kick off when so Talk about that review. You reviewed the Idols. Was it the last Idols album? It was the, yeah, the, the most recent one uh, as of recording. And um, uh, the third Idols album, which, um, I mean, for, first of all, it's a bad, it's a really bad album. Okay, we'll get comments now, won't we, about banging on about this. No, but it's, it's, not, not, it's not a good album. I think they rushed it. You know, I did, wasn't too offended by the first two Idols albums. They're okay, not really my thing bit shouty, um, bit derivative. The third album, you could tell that, I think maybe they'd been pushed to record it earlier than they were ready. Uh, there was stuff in the press release about how the singer was still writing the lyrics in the uh, recording booth, which, you know, that, that'll work for, for some people, but it, <laughs> if you listen to the first line on the Idols album, it, it wasn't working for him. Um, and also, I, w I was um, a bit indignant about their kind of, the, the way they um, portray themselves and the disconnect between their actual actions. Like, if, if you want to be Fugazi, that's great, that's fine. But, uh, you know, that, that, I think that's kind of what they're going for. But you don't do a load of stuff that Fugazi would never do, you know. They, they had, um, one of the things that annoyed me um, was that they did, uh, the, the, their second album, a lot of it was about their um, problems with uh, alcohol and drug uh, addiction or, 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 or overdoing it. I don't know if it was a full, full bore addiction and, and, and all the kind of press they were doing for that uh, was largely centered on, on that kind of thing. And then, you know, a few months after the album came out, they're doing a, uh, their own craft beer line, which, you know, that, Fugazi aren't going to do that, are they? Um, and then there was also this thing about, um, uh, there was, there was, they did a live album and, and made, it was on three different colours of vinyl and you could buy all three colours in a bundle on their website for £100 or whatever if you wanted to own the same album, the exact same album three times in the three different colours. Um, and just that kind of, it felt like they, they're just trying to grow and grow and get as popular as they can, which is fine, um, but don't kind of pretend that you, that you have any ethics. <laughs> is that... <laughs> okay, well, I don't know much about idols. I can't, like, I know, I know the songs and the singles. I don't, I can't, like, um... The bass player used to work at the Exchange in Bristol. That's about my limit of knowledge of the Idols band. Um, uh, musically, I don't know much about them. Anyhow, but what is interesting is that it's quite rare now to see a uh, journalist uh, really take apart music. 
um, in reviews is, is, is why do you think that is? And, and uh... oh yeah, the, there are loads of reasons, and it is something that winds me up. Um, I think what it boils down to is that there's less money sloshing around now. Uh, editors have to be a bit more careful not to um, get on the wrong side of uh, PR or management or record companies. Um, I think also because there's not as much money sloshing around, people don't want to be too harsh on musicians, which is fair enough. And, you know, I, I wouldn't, you know, idols are doing fine. I review them. It's not going to have any impact on their popularity. They're still going to be fine. I'm not going to pick on um, a poor band that's just released their first EP and they're just, they're still learning what they're doing. And, you know, I'm not going to go, oh, you shouldn't have released that you know, be gone, banished to the hills, that kind of thing. Um, but it does annoy me because, because you know, you used to, you, you'll remember, you know, in, in the in the music press um, in the olden days, uh, you know, even in the early days of, of, of uh, Pitchfork or, or whatever, you, you, you'd see um, proper criticism and proper kickings and that kind of thing, which I think is healthy. Really, if, if you pick up a magazine and everything, as many of them are now, everything is like four or five stars out of five for every album release that they cover, more or less. And that just seems almost meaningless to me. If you say everything's brilliant, it, it has no meaning. Um, and and it's, it's almost, almost like you pick them up and you're reading like the Argos catalogue or mm. something. It's just th this is what this album is and it's great. Go and buy it um, or go stream it. Um, and then they, you know, I, and I, you know, most of the things I write are probably po must be positive, to, but you know, occasionally you've got you've got to, you know, because otherwise you've got no credibility if you just think everything's brilliant. It's, I can see both sides. I can see both sides because I, I, for one, I don't. Sometimes I don't see the point in a bad review. Just don't write about it. Okay, well, but yeah. I'm, playing, I'm playing devil's advocate here because I really love reading a bad review. Like, you know, I get more, it's more uh, like seeing a bad accident. I love, you, you can't not look at it when you drive past, <laughs> slow all the traffic down on Twitter to make it all be about you and idols. And they even made a t-shirt, right? Yes, they, yeah, they, they uh, had a quote from the review on the on the t-shirt. And so, you know, they're even making money from my bad review. So uh, good on them, you know, <laughs> it's quite funny, it's quite <laughs> funny. So, okay, what got you into writing? Um, I, I was, I just did it like as a hobby, as a sort of method of procrastination, really, and avoiding other, um, other more pressing concerns in life. Um, and I, I had my own blog, and then I saw Drowned in Sound website was uh, looking for writers, so I started doing stuff for them for a bit. Um, you know, un, unpaid, that kind of thing. And then I'd occasionally get the odd bit of paid work and uh, started writing for the quietus and that kind of thing. And it sort of snowballed. Um, and then it, the sort of penny dropped at, at one point and I, and I thought this this is probably what I'm meant to do mm. uh, and what I probably should have been doing earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, Nick, Nick Cave once uh, said something about how, how the only aspect of his life where he didn't feel mediocre was writing music. And I kind of feel like the only aspect of my life where I don't feel me mediocre is writing about music. Al although, you know, people will, will beg to differ. Readers will beg to differ. <laughs> but that, that's it, basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so Drown in Sound quietus um you're not making a living from that uh i'm i i was for a bit mm. um just solely writing uh i've, I've also started teaching writing as well mm. teaching music journalism uh at the bim institute in manchester which is a music college and uh university um uh, but, you know, it's not just for musicians. They also have like event management, 
music journalism, PR stuff, that kind mm. of thing. Uh, and I've started doing stuff for the University of Huddersfield as well, which has its own uh, music journalism BA still. Oh, really? Um, which I think is, is, he is healthy to kind of, I mean, most writers probably don't make a living from just solely from writing anymore. And they might do bits of copy editing or proofreading or editing or um, uh, delivery cycling or whatever it, it may be. Um, and I think it's good if you just sit, if you're just in your room all day trying to, trying to come, you know, come up with good stuff, it, 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 it quickly grinds to a halt and, and, it's, and it can be pretty lonely. Um, yeah. So mix it up a bit. Can, can be, I'm, I'm surprised that you can do a degree in music journalism. What, what, am, should I be surprised at this? Um, I've possibly, yeah, because um, music journalism is arguably not as robust as it was. But then, you know, they, they do all sorts of different modules as well that covers other things. And a lot of the skills are transferable to you know, all sorts of professions. And they do bits of like uh, media journalism as well, uh, film stuff, radio stuff, that kind of thing. And, you know, if, if someone wants to, if someone gets to the end of a music journalism degree and then decides, oh, I want to be uh, a sports journalist, you know, it's dead easy. Um, as long as they know about cricket or whatever to, to make that transition. Yeah, well, there's just that's, you, you, you've now learned a hundred ways of saying that something is awesome using different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but the reason, like, one of the reasons I wanted to get you on to talk was because for whatever reason, I got sent a book that you've written. Okay. And it's not out until uh, September. Is that still the case? Is it out in September? That, yes, that's that's the case. Yes, I don't I don't even have a copy yet. You've got a copy and I don't. It's well thumbed, see, so look. Yeah, I'm um you, I'm, what I'm guilty of. Is, you've read it by. Uh, what I love family. doing, I love turning the pages. I yeah. love and I love annoying people that don't like turning the. But it's a book, right? It's supposed to be thumbed and read. So um, Absolutely. so yeah, I got this maybe ten days ago, and um, I've ploughed through it. Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I, I read it quick and it's awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. That's very kind of you. To um, it covers an enormous, uh, it's called, it's called this in case there we are. Um, we'll pause it for a second while people read the long title of the book, catchy long title of the book. Um, I, I, I didn't demand that my name was printed that large on the on the cover. That's just what the designers sent us. So yeah, there it is. Um, that's not my arrogance there. Or JR's arrogance, I could say. He's a different person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, how did this come about? Um, I was... Very lucky, actually, because, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I was thinking about doing a book of some sort. I had a couple of ideas for book, for books, which might uh, turn up in the future. But I, I was sort of wondering about that. And then uh, Dave Watkins, my editor at Reaction, he, he got in touch with me out of the blue. He'd read... Um, my stuff on the quieter so I, I do the um, bi-monthly psych rock noise rock column and other bits of pieces and he liked my writing and he uh, had this vague idea for you know a, a book about heavy music but not you know going beyond heavy metal yeah. um, and uh, it, his 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 he was, you know, it, that was the vaguest, you know, gave, gave me the vaguest idea, heavy music. He said it could be um, sort of, do you know Julian Cope's Copendium book? Yes. Oh, yeah, got yeah. it. Uh, so that kind of thing in terms of content, vaguely, but then uh, in terms of the approach, more like uh, Rob Young's history of uh, folk music. You familiar with that one? Yes. Um yeah, um, and so and I, and I and I thought, yeah, that's that's a great idea. And then I had to kind of come up with a much more detailed proposal about what I would uh, cover 
in such a book. And then that went back and forwards between us for a bit. Um, and, you know, I won't bore you with the details of the publishing world, but now it's a book. Hooray. It's a lot <laughs> so, of work. So it's out in September. When did you start to give people an idea of how long? Oh, this God, uh, it took eight, the first draft took 18 months. Uh, and then, you know, you get a, you get a few months of of uh, bouncing it back between Dave, my editor, and uh, copy editors, and another editor as well. So, and you know, you, t you tinker with it a bit, and you improve it, and you cut out the waffle. Of course, some of the waffle was still quite a lot of waffle. Out the waffle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know, and then it takes ages to you know get it printed and all that kind of stuff. So it's a lot. It is a long process. Yeah, yeah. You know. And you haven't seen it yet. Uh, you know, I've seen it on PDF, but I don't have a physical copy yet. So you're very, you're very privileged. You're one of the first people that, that's read it outside um, reaction, I suppose. Why would they not send you a copy? <laughs> I think <laughs> they'll send they'll send me. That's just a, a, an uncorrected proof, right? So they'll they'll send me finished copies. But I think they think it's more important that reviewers and people like, with their own YouTube channel get them. You know. They get priority, not not the author. <laughs> well, what's awesome about it is, and it, the reason I have a Funkadelic album out here is, um, you cover it like you say. It's not just um, a Black Sabbath, uh, and then up to uh, I don't know whatever the hell's heavy nowadays. Um, I don't know, Mastodon, whoever. It's not. It's not just. It's not just that stuff. You're covering this sort of stuff as well. I mean, it's from 1968 to the present, but this is like late 60s, early 70s, George Clinton. And I love the fact that there's a chapter on that sort of thing as well. Yeah, I, I, that was, you know, it, if, you, if you're looking at heavy music beyond heavy metal, you know, the, I, I'm not knocking heavy metal, as, but there's, you know, there's been lots yeah. of books on heavy metal already, the history of heavy metal. Yeah. Um, you know, heaviness is a really broad church and yeah. there are loads of different ways you can approach it. Um, and, you know, maybe people wouldn't expect to see a, a chapter on funk, but funk is really important. You know, it's not not only is a funkadelic really heavy at, at times, you know, they're, they're such a huge influence on, um, you know, uh, a lot of the post-punk bands, um, Gang of Four, people like that. Uh, the you know must have influenced Fugazi. Uh, they've their tabs were into them, um, you know. So yeah, I want I wanted to I wanted to have, you know it's hard because there's so much heavy music, but I, I wanted to have funk in there. And I also I didn't want it to just just be um, you know band, bands of you know three or four white guys um, going yeah. yeah we're we're really heavy we're the heaviest thing ever you know because. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, there's more to it than that. Oh yeah, heaviness isn't just about tuning down to B and jamming mm. one off. It, yeah, it can yeah. be, but it's, there can be way more to it than that as well. From, mm. from for me, like lyrically and everything, it, I can. I've, I'm in a minute. We, we've both decided. If anyone's ever watched these before, I normally hand over like five or six subjects, and then we end up talking about records. But for uh, Mr. J R Moore's, we've decided also to pick our top five heavy records um and um we've both picked about 100 but we're trying to edit it down to five. um and for me it's not just about like i say just tuning down to be there's other reasons why something's heavy and it can be the time it was released or it can be the lyrical content or it can just be just a feeling do you know what i mean like it's not mm. um it's a state of mind not a style or something yeah <laughs> But, but going back to the book, you do, you cover, um, I could go through the chapter bits, but you're doing from funk to uh, like the Sabbath stuff to, but you start with essentially to get, not to give it away, but you start with Helter Skelter by the Beatles. And um, I love the Beatles and, and like, and I know they get credit for all sorts of things, but often heaviness isn't one of them particularly. Mm. As, you know, and when when I saw that you were starting to write about that, I wasn't expecting that song to be the one you went with either. But um, yeah, uh, which song which song were you expecting? 
uh, something off Abbey Road, maybe. Oh. Um, but uh, the, the um, White Album, which is the, 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 the like, talk about anti-heavy sleep. Like, it's, it's not even. <laughs> <laughs> So why did you pick that? Like, what made you think Helter Skelter is the... I mean, well, I love Paul McCartney and almost everything Paul McCartney does. Mm. Um, people that don't like Paul McCartney annoy me. People that don't claim to not like the Beatles annoy me even more. Um, do you like the Beatles, Joe? I love the Beatles. Good, okay. I've, I've got, I wouldn't have records by the Beatles. Yeah. This is, I'll tell you what, this, let's talk about this record here. This is a uh, Greek version. <laughs> it's got the EMI logo and everything, and the address is in Greek. Wow. I can't really see That's it. probably worth loads of money it's, outside Greece. I bought, I bought this when I was about 15 on holiday in um, Athens, right? And um, so I didn't really think about it being Greek until I got home, and I was like, oh, man, that's in Greek. Um, and at the, uh, uh, as an aside, at Athens Airport with my mum and dad and brother, um, I, I always get sick when I go abroad, or I certainly did when I was young. And I got to the airport and I was holding this record and a few other bits. And uh, there's a bunch of travellers there. And I looked round at a traveller and I threw up. On, oh. I threw up on this guy. It was a total nightmare. But luckily, he was kind of peace and love and was all like, oh, it's fine. Athens. That's <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, why Helter, Helter, Helter? It's a good story, the Helter Skelter thing, because Paul McCartney's flicking through um, a magazine and he sees Pete Townsend boasting about having written, I can't remember these exact words, but the heaviest, dirtiest, mm. rockiest, most awesomest track ever recorded. And Paul McCartney goes, ah, oh really? And I, I don't think he's even heard it. I think it turns out to be I Can See For Miles, but he's, he doesn't, I don't think he's heard the Who track. Um, and he just goes, right, no, the Beatles are going to do that. We're going to record the heaviest, dirtiest, nastiest yeah. rock song I've ever done. Um, and what I love about it, Helter Skelter particularly, I mean, you, you know, I'm, I'm being slightly facetious by saying Paul McCartney invented heaviness with that one track. You know, it, obviously it's more complicated than that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really riff driven there's two bass guitars on it there's um a really scronky noise bit in in the middle or towards the end where they're just kind of going mad in the studio um and you can kind of trace lots of different genres back to that if you like you know it sounds a bit noise rock mm. um it's not it's not reliant on sort of technical technical wizardry which put, puts me off um a little bit in terms of heaviness it's it's a bit stoner rock a bit de deserty um a, a bit grungy butch vig said it was the first grunge song um and it all it all goes back to that um and you know it, it was just a, a good a sort of bold way to open <laughs> no, i agree it makes but it makes and it makes a great read the whole book does I, I sort of different, um, different takes of it as well, Helter Skelter. You know, there's one where it's like half an hour long or something, and they've never released it, which um, is where Ringo's blisters on his fingers comes from, and that kind of thing. And in my head, that's like a you know, a, a, I don't know if it's, this is accurate, but that's like a, a stoner rock, you know, blitz sound masterpiece. You know, I don't know if they'll ever release it though. Uh, well, they'll release it, of course. Will. Everything gets released. Yeah. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> <laughs> um but yeah like it really it really goes through and, and i like the way that um it's not again you cover an an, an influence from the helter skelter thing and the reason i'm showing it you cover it as well is uh the downward spiral album yes i've got that here somewhere yeah so it's recorded yeah so it's like you know Keep talking, Joe. I'm just going to look for my coffee. No, I love it. We get to see your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Influential album, of course, but influenced by. It doesn't sound much, anything like the Beatles particularly, but, you know, there's 
Did yeah, you... and they, they were into the whole sort of Charles Manson thing as well, weren't they? Nine Inch Nails and the embarrassing Charles Manson thing. Yeah, which is a, quite unsavoury. Um, I, but you know, that's really, I mean, you only really, really <laughs> only really need one Nine Inch Nails album, don't you? And it's it's that. I mean, they've never done anything anywhere near as good as that. No, but you but, but you but you cover it in the book, and, and anyhow, I, I think that. If, so it's out in September, and if anyone, um, I don't know, people should tuck into it because it got, like I said, it goes from the Beatles all the way through to pigs. You bookend it with Beatles, are Beatles animals, <laughs> they're insects, right? But pigs are animals. You, you, yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> There's some sort of full circle yeah. thing going on somehow. Yeah, from Beatles to pigs via everything hefty from like Albini to. Uh, Black Flag and Big Black and uh, all the heavy shit as well, including including both these classics, the Tad album there, and the uh, Heavier Than a Death and the Family, Les Razil's The Nudes album, however you say it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's great stuff. So give me, uh, let's have a look at your five heaviest records. You pick oh, one and then I'll pick one. I mean, this pick, is, this, well, this. My, my first one is two, really. Yeah. Um, because they're kind of a around the same time and thematically linked. Yeah. I should say, before we start looking at this is a bit of a CD household, and I don't know uh, how controversial that is, but um, I love CDs. I've got one here. I've got one in my top five. I've got a CD. And, uh, Good. I don't even have a car. So, you know, it's, I know you've talked to previously, previous episodes about how CDs are great to have in the car. I don't even drive, so I don't know why I've got so many CDs. Um, but you don't want to turn over. You don't want to get up off the sofa, do you, and turn uh, turn over the side on either of these dopuses, as I call them now, uh, which is Sleeps, Dope Smoker, Original um, Sleeps, Original Sleeps, uh, Dope Throne by Electric Wizard. Um, Especially this one because it, you know it's it's one song that lasts an hour, yeah. um, and I know there's a you know it probably sounds better on this the Southern Lord vinyl double vinyl reissue or whatever, but to it to interrupt it you know to, <laughs> to turn it over a few times during the one song that is on it is is kind of. Um, uh, Blasphemy or something, I think. But that's got to be one of the heaviest albums yeah. of all time. It's just it's just relentless. It's just riff after riff after riff, really slow, really dense um, sound to it. Yeah. Um, there's a guitar solo every now and then, but obviously just <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just a little bit. You know, it's it's not Matt Pike going mad. Um, and it, it, it's so it's so dense that it, you kind of hear different elements in it each time you listen to it, yeah, and you kind yeah. of flowing in and out as well, and that, and that's another reason why. I'm looking for uh, the big. Oh, am I going to find this? Am I? What the hell? Oh, I don't know. I don't know where it is, but there's a quote in here you've picked up from them about why they end up doing that. <laughs> song about weed and they just say it's because of the weed or some shit like that Why do you have so many songs about weed i think it was because of the weed or yeah, something, something like that. yeah. Um, but okay. it wasn't just the weed was it they had a, they had the sort of record company dispute and what was driving yeah. them mad. Is, is that the um is that on tp i think it is this one yeah 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 my the vinyl version i've got has that sleeve and it's on tp and it, it is a double but yeah because the sleeve is different now, it's more, it's like a science fiction-y, looks like Star Wars or some shit like that. Yeah, it does, yeah. I don't know why they, why did they change the sleeve? What's the point of that? I don't know, and I think, um, what's the drummer's name? I've forgotten, but there's a quote, did I leave that quote in the book? He's not happy with any of the sleeves, I don't think. He thinks it kind of misrepresents what they were about. I don't know what his what his ideal sleeve would be. Bongs. <laughs> bongs. <laughs> Big pile of bongs. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's most logical. So I'm gonna pick if you've picked two, I'm picking two. Yeah. 
similar-ish era, give or take a year or two. Um, I've just gone for these two. Oh. Um, similar-ish era, give or take a year. Um, and, and like there's- both, both fans of Helter Skelter, I'm sure. I'm sure, but they're, they're both, you know, in terms of like product, it's the production at the time, the fact that they were like rejected by the mass world for being like too out there, but have influenced so much. If you listen now, they're still heavy. Like music that gets recorded now, like sounds heavier, but it's not heavier. Like, and I pick I only put in, in case anyone cares. The reason I picked this Sabbath album is because of War Pigs. There's no heavier song than War Pigs. It's because it's the space and the lyrical content. Mm. It's so like anti being anti-war I think is quite heavy in its own way um so yeah yeah and it's not it's not in a sort of hippie way is it like putting flowers in uh, oh. the ends of rifles or whatever it's like a, it's a really bleak anti-war yeah. um vibe yeah and I mean the whole album is brilliant but uh that's and, and also like Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I love that guy. Isn't that amazing? Because, it, yeah, it was, oh, gosh. And, the, the sort of ancient slash futuristic warrior. And it's it's on the front as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that it sort of sums up Sabbath, that, doesn't it? That kind of ramshackle, yeah. ramshackle genius. Yeah. So go on, go for your second. Um, what was I? Well, I've, I've gone... I've actually got a vinyl here. Um, there, there, was, there was quite a lot of vinyl o- over there, actually, but it's not very good for the I angle. And the oh. <laughs> so this is quite a recent reissue of uh, Gluey Porch Treatments by <laughs> Melvins. And, I mean, a bit like what you were saying there with with War Pigs, it's um, it eye flies, really, on this album, which is the, the opening track. And it's just so slow and dirgy and grimly recorded and such and so weird as well. And God knows what he's singing about high flies. Um, yeah. And, the, you know, the, re- the rest of the album's amazing as well. You could pick any Melvin's record, really, more or less, in your, in your heaviest of all time. Mm. I absolutely love them. They're one of my favourite favourite bands ever, because um, they're so weird, and I just think they're heavier than most like typical heavy metal bands, mm. as well. Sometimes they've got two drummers, sometimes they've got two bassists. Uh, they're always doing mad stuff, um, and and uh, what they, they're always they're always kind of in in your typical sort of heavy metal. Um, histories or your books about rock music they're like a footnote aren't they they're like oh and Kurt Cobain used to hang around with these guys uh and and that's it but there's so much more than the the Nirvana Association and they're a bit like the Velvet Underground I think in that they've influenced you know such a range of different people yeah. sludge metal stoner you know desert rockers noise rock you know, their influence stretches far and wide and they're still a bit uh, underrated, if that's the word, underappreciated. Yeah. Always crazy artwork as well. Yeah, it's by his, well, I don't know if that one is, but the, the later ones is all by his partner, isn't it? Yes, that's right, yeah. yeah. And she does this kind of, uh, they're sort of almost cute illustrations, certainly not your typical mm. heavy, that, heavy that- artwork. Yeah, was that a gatefold sleeve? Uh, no, it's not this one, but it does. Have, uh, it's coloured vinyl, and it's got a nice little booklet in it somewhere um, mm. of, of Buzz Osborne uh, writing about his often miserable memories of putting the album together and getting annoyed with everyone, as, as he does. And what labels put that out? This is for on Ipecac. Right. Uh, originally, it was Alchemy, I think. Yeah, yeah, the version. The yeah, the version I've got is alchemy, and it's just white. Yeah, black and white sleeve. Uh, but it's got a picture of like the three of them on the back, like Matt Lukin on bass, right? Mud Honey guy. Yeah, yeah, uh, and uh, uh, I think 
Buzz talks it talks in, in this booklet about how the bassist Matt Lukin, who went on to play in Mudhoney, couldn't couldn't get the hang of eye flies at all. He just like really struggled to play it. Why is it so slow? What's happening? I can't play that slow. I'm from punk, punk background, and you're asking me to do this seven minute song or whatever it is. On on, on the back of mine as well, I see just then. I'm pretty mm. sure that mine's got like the big info thanks list at the bottom. Oh, right. And, and it has like uh, Kurt Cobain, it spells his name in a crazy way. And I'm pretty sure mine's got all the, yeah, like a big thanks list just on the back there rather than. Yeah, well, this is just, yeah, this is a new one. So, yeah. New, yeah. The reissue. And they've changed, the sleeve as, they've changed the sleeve as well. What is it with these heavy bands and changing sleeves? <laughs> Good question. What are they doing? <laughs> My second one. I'm trying to get you to buy all the different copies. Yeah, I know. Uh, talking of slow, and I listened to this earlier whilst I was thinking about doing this and whatever else, and um, I couldn't believe how much I enjoyed it. Uh, and it's a CD. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, this wasn't one of my choices in the end, but I do have it to hand. Yeah, it's it's, ins it. it's insane. It's so good. Like in, uh, I can't put my finger on why it's good. And if I said to someone go and listen to it, they'd be like, "What the hell are you doing to me?" But yeah, <laughs> I um, I've said it before, but uh, no, I can never find it. I first heard about these on a, a sub pop video that came out, and there was a video of them playing black and white video in a basement. And it's not on. It's not on this. It's some other song, and um, it stood out so much on that compilation. And then when you listen to it, you just can't believe what you're listening to. Like it's mm. just even now. Like, and yeah. and and I, and I think it's um, it's more to it's more connected with the Dead Sea, which is why I'm holding this up. The band, the Dead Sea, and uh, sort of droney stuff than it is like Black Sabbath, who they obviously sort of half stole their name from. Um, yeah, it, it's just more. There's more to it. I don't can't put my finger on what the hell's going it's, on. It, yeah, it's so layered, isn't it? And the timing is all off, sort of. Yeah. Um, and it. I mean, again, you don't want that on vinyl, do you? You just want you. You, you need it on CD because you need to just stick it on and uh, yeah. experience it from beginning to end. I think it probably fills. The running time on a CD. Um, there's drums on it. I only noticed that. Like I don't know how many times I've listened to it. Like on one of the tracks, some drums turn up. Have you, have you noticed that? They sort of fade in. Someone's like, "Oh, should we have some drums?" And then they disappear again. Like amongst all this, like just or, or just the relentless riffs, really slow riffs, which I think is like a nice kind of humorous touch as well. Um, a lot of the heavy music I like has has an element of humour, um, or an element of what do you call it in your book, Joe? Oh, let's advertise your book, shall we? Let's stop. Like. Bye. <laughs> There's something. So, no, because it's interesting. Because you say it's what where you're writing about heavy music, because um, you you write about being into metal and then kind of going off it when you're in your teens. But still being into heavy stuff. Element, so there is some element of fallibility to it, is what you said. I see. I didn't pick that sleeve. What a total nightmare! <laughs> it's good. My son. Yeah, took that, my son took that photo. Oh, that, that's the other thing. You need some sort of human element. You say you're not into rock stars, and even the kind of bigger rock heavy bands you're into have that kind of. Yeah. fallible hum humanity in it and i think i'm the same yeah i think with like black sabbath and stuff you can sense that you know there's some it's you know they're not singing about i don't know they're not necessarily sleeping you know, it's talking about sort of sleeping with women and all that sort of stuff it, it's just there's something bigger and better going on like yeah or deeper or something i don't know and um yeah like this like i mean look at them <laughs> I know he's got his morbid, morbid angel t long sleeve t shirt on, hasn't he? Yeah. Dave is holding a coffee cup or something. 
I mean, I can't, it, it, it's like, and it's on Sub Pop, and you're thinking how, you know, all right, Sub Pop might have been quite open-minded at the time, but it's still amazing it ever got released, really. Yeah. Yeah, what else was, what else was out there like it at the time? Well, maybe Dead Sea, when did Dead Sea date back to? Maybe Dead Sea, maybe on yeah. something there. Yeah, that sort of thing, maybe, but, but still. Yeah. Uh, go for it. Do another one. Do another one. Hit you with another one. Mm. Um, well, shall we have a bit of Scum by Napalm Death? Yeah. Which, you know, I mean, the, the, the point of the book isn't to determine the heaviest music that's ever been made. Mm. Um, it's about the story of heavy yeah. music. Um, but I think when, you know, if people ask, you know, what's, well, if people ask me what, what's the heaviest album, I'll, I'll usually go for Dope Smoker. And when people ask what's the heaviest band, I usually go, go to Napalm Death. Yeah, so there uh, is, I'm just trying to find it, there is a chapter in here on that, on particularly that album. And you talk to Nick Bull and, and whatever else. And also, I think um, it's worth mentioning uh, when you do the edit of this before it gets released, uh, to add that Nick Bullen's also in Rainbow Grave. Yes, and, and Rainbow I like Grave. Rainbow Grave. Yeah, um, and I think the book was written. Was it written before Rainbow Grave came out? I can't I remember. Know. But yeah, you're right. Rainbow Grave, uh, excellent. But the, the re but the reason I mention that is because he talks about perhaps moving on from. <laughs> Not moving on, whatever. He's, he's, he's doing other music like electronic, like Scorn and whatever else he does. But actually, he goes back and right Rainbow Grave now with a fellow called Doom and whatever else. He's pretty heavy. So he hasn't given up totally. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But the That's chapter's the problem. Good. The, the chapter's good the problem on it. Right. Uh, another, another thing, I, I, um, I end kind of talking about Richard Dawson and how he heavy music has influenced musicians who are not necessarily in the heavy. Hmm. Um, spectrum because obviously Richard's a, a bit of a folky if you, if you want to put him in a box um, and that that's quite a nice nice tidy way, way to end end the book but he's um, he's got a heavy metal album coming out with the band Circle um, yeah. soon so would have been useful to know that <laughs> before <laughs> before everything was signed up but you know that you can't help these things can you no, oh my god, no. But anyway, yeah, Napalm Death. I don't know if that's even the heaviest Napalm Death album, but you know, it's got that that kind of uh again, the sort of ramshackle naivety to it in a way, and the, the way it's recorded. Mm. Um I went through a phase of um like I, I have quite bad insomnia a lot of the time, and I went through a phase in my life where I would just I couldn't sleep and I put on Napalm Death, like, but on a really quiet volume and I like one or two on the stereo or whatever. And I found that really relaxing in a weird way. I, it's very interesting because he says it in here, doesn't he? Where he can, yeah. can like compares like, correct me if I'm wrong, it's something along the lines of loud Brian Eno versus quiet Napalm Death being very similar. Yeah, and, and, and I agree because I've got like um, his a uh, we used to so I've got two kids they're grown up now but when they were young one of the records I used to send them to sleep to or Lisa and I my wife used to send them to sleep to was this it's by Five on Torture Gun. oh like and it's like kind of one note but like yeah like that they're playing like there's loads of riffs but they're just playing one note <laughs> you know like how you play like <laughs> like that. And it's on torture, and it's just one note, and it's really heavy, and it's it sends them to sleep, but, you know. And so, yeah, like listening to like the Scum album or listening to Brian Eno, they kind of can be the same in the right context. Agreed. Yeah, that ambient, really, really loud ambient music can just be completely overwhelming. Yeah, as you well. say that. yeah. Who, who um, is it you see that you can't stay in the room for? It's, yeah, it's, it's it's William Basinski at ATP. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I, I think John John Doran from the Quietus had had a similar experience. He had, he felt really ill and had to leave the room or something. And I felt like he was whiteying, even though he'd had no drugs that day. Or was it when he's still on drugs? I don't know. Um, but God, it was it was just like it was the it was so loud 
and it was just so repetitive and there was something weird going on in the way it was coming out the speakers or something mm. and i it, it just made people feel like seasick it was weird yeah no it's 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 he makes a good point so that's nick bullen talking about scum in this um mm. so my I've got three records now that aren't necessarily heavy guitar records, but I think they're really heavy. And this is one of the heaviest bands I've seen in the last few years. And it's low. Ah. Um, and it's, uh, they, they, were, they were touring their recent album on Sub Pop. But I think that the ones here where it's, I just find them so heavy. <laughs> like, yeah. But not like in like loud, heavy sort of Sabbathy way, but just in a different way. It's like brutal to me. And then, so we saw them at, um, for whatever reason, we ended up at Glastonbury Festival a couple of years ago. And then the only band I saw pretty much that I paid any attention to was Low. And it was hef so heavy. And like the bass, the sub bass was just like brutally heavy. And vocally, it's so sort of, uh, it just cuts through me so much. <laughs> so emotionally heavy. Yes. Yeah, sometimes I have to turn them off and I can't listen to them. Yeah. Because they're also really, really sad at times mm. um and it becomes like oh god yeah um the two a, bit, a bit like um a bit like you've been talking about my bloody valentine haven't you in, in previous episodes and it, it just kind of can overwhelm you emotionally low mm. if you if you're not feeling yeah. stirred yeah that's, um, it's like i've got three that do that to me low i have to be completely in the right mood to listen to low um, Loveless, My Bloody Valentine, I cannot listen to it at all um, for whatever reason. It, it, I've got it and I love it, but I cannot listen to it because it just crushes me. And Nick Drake, I can't listen to Nick Drake. I've got like the Nick Drake box set, like it's got four or five CDs in it, albums or whatever. <laughs> it just like, it's so brutal to me. Like everything about his story. And then when um, Elisa was uh, um, going through contractions for their first, for Stan, so this is like August 2000, she's about to give birth. And we, we stay in, in the house waiting for the midwife to come and take, you know, and say, oh, you've got to go to the hospital now because we listened to all of the Nick Drake albums in a row. For whatever reason, at the time, it felt right. Not been able to listen to it at all since. Like, not a single, anything comes on. Even if you sound like Nick Drake, I have to turn you off. <laughs> there you go. Wow. <laughs> what is going on there? No. Um like, do you know uh, the Great Destroyer by Low? Yeah, go on. Yeah, I like that one as well because that's that's the one where they actually do go heavy. You know, they've been slow and quiet for for years, and then they kind of, it's it's kind of like a rock album, but really weird. Yeah. Um, when I go deaf, it's got When I Go Deaf on it, which is you know about looking forward to losing losing his hearing so he doesn't have to play music anymore something along those lines that's quite heavy too they did that christmas album as well didn't they <laughs> mm. <laughs> happy <Yeah>. christmas <laughs> happy christmas yeah mm. oh god yeah some of that's quite bleak as well <laughs> but it's um, so heavy music it stuff, stuff about jesus on it and yeah and, so heavy music I mean, doesn't have to be just crushing but i think that's mm. all, i don't need to say that Go on. Mm. Got another one? Um, I've got two more. Yeah. This will just not. This is this was the one to annoy people. Idols. Oh, the best album of the last decade or whatever it is. Um, you know, I love <laughs> Lulu by Lou Reed and Metallica. I love Lou Reed in general. Uh, I love. I also, I also love Metallica in a way, although I don't listen to them as, as often as I do Lou Reed. Um, it's got to be heavy. It's got a you know parental advisory, bad language sticker on it, and it's annoyed so many people. So many people hate it and think it should have never have been released, and that must make it heavy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best thing they've done since the eighties. Metallica, I love it. They mm. sound so freed on it, freed from the expectations of being Metallica and just being Lou Reed's backing band and just like going, going with their instincts and loosening up a bit and um, singing ridiculous lyrics 
about God knows what it's about. That's, um, the, that's the album with the song about the table on it, right? With what, sorry? The thing about a table. Yeah, I am the table, yeah. <laughs> Although, I, you know, again, you know, if you look at the lyric sheet, can I find that one? I forgot what the title is. It says I am the tablet, right, in the lyric sheet, at least on the first instance that that line is mentioned. And I wonder whether James Hetfield just got like con confused and just, just started shouting, I am the table, and they kept it in. Maybe that's what happened. Um, but I, I, what I love about Metallica is that they just, you know, you, you can look at Metallica and think, oh, they're the biggest metal band in the world. Um, you know, they just they just kind of sold out on, on the, the Black album, decided to become the biggest metal acts in the world and they've just kind of been you know trying to sustain that level and playing arenas the whole time blah de blah de blah but actually they they're constantly annoying their own fans all through throughout the you know writing a ballad oh you've written a ballad oh, cutting their hair oh why they cut their hair you know uh doing the uh the um uh, do uh, Saint Anger, no guitar solos. Oh, why have they done no guitar solos? Do you know, and doing this, you know, they they really annoy their own fan base while staying at that level somehow, and I think find that fascinating. Well, I'm putting no bass on Justice for All. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's another one. There's loads <laughs> of examples. Um, yeah. And Lou, and Lou Reed, of course, is the same, you know, just, an, I, I love, I, I, I'm, I am drawn to artists who just annoy their own fans. Lou Reed, Neil Young, um, I'm less bothered about Bob Dylan, but I'll probably, that'll probably click with me at, at some One point. Day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got two more. I'm going for, uh, because I love this sort of music so much and I think it can be heavy. This is Cannibal Ox, uh, Cold, The Cold Vein. Heavy as hell production LP now run the jewels produced it. It's just really hefty. Uh, great, great one of the great uh, underground hip hop albums, but heavy as hell. When did you get into that? Oh, years ago. I don't know when the hell this came out, but I got it when it came out. Mm. When, did, when the hell did it come out? I think it's quite hard to get the vinyl version now. I think this. In fact, they need to they need to reissue this shit. I guess uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know, whenever it came out, mm. whenever the hell that was, uh, probably 2000, is it? don't know. But yeah, no idea. But uh, absolutely love it. And it's heavy as hell. And you can tell their influence. You can tell that they like all sorts of music. Yeah, um, ov yeah obviously heaviness extends beyond guitars. Mm. Um, but I originally I was going to, in the book, I was going to delve into... Uh, different, less guitar-based genres, but in the end, it was so unwieldy anyway. Yeah. I had to kind of rein it in a bit. I was going to do a chapter on dub, uh, and you know, even even like techno and stuff. But you've got to kind of draw the line somewhere, haven't you? But you're right. You know, heaviness is not just uh, rooted in rock at all. No, no, no. In fact, seeing as you've mentioned it, I'll just. This was my fifth one, and it's the bug, like. Kind of dubby, super heavy. Saw it last time I saw him, Supersonic. It virtually destroyed me. It was so brutal. Um, and you know, you can out heavy almost anyone. And that's yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I love the bug. Every, you know, again, Supersonic. You know, he's, he, in my head, he plays every year. But yeah. I don't know if that's right. Um, <laughs> sometimes with different collaborators. Well, always with different collaborators. Um, and he's he's always on really late, isn't he? Like mm. way past my bedtime. And can, can I can I stay up for the bug? And then he comes on and just destroys, destroys yeah. your chest and all sorts. Yeah, that's what it was for me. So you got one more? Uh, I've gone for uh, you know one of my favourite bands, which is uh, Bardo Pond, Lapsed by Bardo Pond, um, which I mean they kind of get neglected by certainly get neglected by magazines that cover heavy music um, and just in general, really. 
but they were, they were a cult prospect, Philadelphian psych rock, and just really heavy, just loads of pedals going on. Um, a bit like a sort of heavier take on shoegaze, I suppose, in a way. And then you've got um, uh, Isabel, the singer, who's kind of floating on top of all the heaviness, and she also um, plays flute sometimes as well. So there's a weird kind of contrast. Mm. But it's, that it's a heaviness that really lifts you. I find it, I, you know, if I see them live, I feel like I'm elevating when, when that kind of distortion kicks in. A lot of heaviness is kind of downward, you know, mm. head banging and floor punching. It's, it's, it's sort of gravitational, isn't it? And, uh, it down, the, the movement is pulling you down, but with Bardo Pond, I find they're really heavy, but they're kind of lifting you on a sort of cloud of distortion and all sorts of weird effects. and. Uh, sort of abstract mm. uh, song structures and, and all sorts. So yeah, I'll come to that. Do, do, you, do you think they get dismissed, or no, not dismissed isn't the right word, uh, they don't get the credit because of longevity? Sometimes longevity can work against the band. They don't have... Yeah, um, mate, well, that's right, isn't it? Same, Yola Tengo. Yeah, that. same with Hey Colossus. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, I was thinking, in terms of Bardo Pond, Yola Tengo and stuff, like they're continuously... Mm good but like journalistically I've, as a journalist I've, what how do you grab onto a new bardo pond album and and sell it i just the, i just insist on reviewing everything that they release yeah. and giving it five out of five and, yeah. and i and all the reissues as well um because i love them that much um but you're right it is it is it, is, it, is, it can be difficult can't it as a journalist especially if you're freelance you're kind of pitching um, you're not pitching uh, to, to editors, you're not saying um, this is a great band that has made a great album, can I interview them? Yeah. That's not enough, You usually, depending on what's going on, uh, for an editor to, to say yes, write about them please, you know, you, you've got to, you, you, they need a story, yeah. um, you, you pitch a story, not, not, a, not, not a band or an album, uh, which um, uh, it's kind of problematic in a way because um, what happens is that you know you get I, I suppose it that that does benefit new bands you know um, who have got a lot to say or a, a water wage or whatever but also it means you know a lot of the times the story is this band's done all the drugs yeah. uh, and maybe oh, oh but now they've stopped doing all the drugs Mm. Uh, so, so that's the story, um, and well, that is. Here's the thing regarding that. I, I won't name the band, but anyone who knows, anyone who knows me knows what band this is. They, they, they were the band that did all the drugs, and then yeah. there was a whole load of articles about them not, now not doing drugs, and that was, like, as you said, exactly the story. We played somewhere about a month after they played there. The people who put that on said they're still the band that do all the drugs. Yeah, like, the story the story was just absolutely like complete bullshit made up. Like, yeah, and it's how they get press. It's how bands get press. Is their PR person or whoever the hell runs their labels? Like, okay, yeah, we need another story. You're now the band that doesn't do drugs. And it's the same with like, uh, um, whatever those hello type magazines are, where it's like, uh, this person's lost all the weight. This person's put on all the weight. This person's lost all the weight, and it's like month after month after month, and it's just like. To get press inches. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> Everyone. Does. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a, you know, and that's why uh, Royal Trucks are better known than Bardo Pond because I'm not Royal... talking about Royal Trucks. No, I know you're not. I know, I know, I know you're not. I'm talking about Royal Trucks, but you know, mm. that's you know, that's why everyone knows about them. I, I guess Bardo Pond have done a lot of drugs, but it's not been a kind of. It's not been, the, I presume, not the really bad drugs, and they've not kind of exploited it in the same way. It's not the story, it's like that. Yeah, mm. they haven't. That's not the story they've sold. And yeah, yeah. I, it, yeah. It, it 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 does bring me down when it's more about the story than the music, journalistically. Mm. And sometimes, and, and I get worn out by it, and I end up just not reading any <laughs> any of it because I'm like, I don't need to know you went to a log cabin during lockdown to record this album. Like, what the hell does it sound like? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what the answer is really. I don't think there is 
I don't think that's going to change. No. Um, and we're it's, a, I mean, it's a boring story that, you know, we did drugs, now we've stopped doing drugs, even though we haven't stopped doing drugs. You yeah. know, why, why is that an exciting story to commission? It has been told, you know, since since 1968 or whenever, over and over again, just different groups. Yeah. Well, everyone fell for it. Yeah. <laughs> that was that. Um, so, but the main reason we talk, apart from the book, is I send you a list of things, list of subjects to pick records for. Okay, so we're going to go for a record from your favourite record shop. My record, favourite record shop. So my favourite record shop, I've decided, is, uh, I know it's already been mentioned in a previous, at least one previous episode, which is Beatdown Records in Newcastle. Okay. Um, what I like about, well, I love Newcastle anyway. It's a, a, a great city. It's where I went to university and I'm very, I'm very fond of it still. And it's always had good good record shops. I think there was a there was a phase after I left when a lot of record shops all over the place were closing down, and it went through a bit of a bump then. But it's it's um, it's back <laughs> again. There are quite a few yeah. there. Um, Beatdown Records. One of the things I like about it, well, this is my um, sort of qualifier really for a great record shop. If, if the record shop has its own dedicated noise section, even better if it has its own dedicated Japanese noise section, that's the mark of a good record shop. Even if you're not in the mood for buying any noise, um, you know, if it's got that, then it must have all sorts of things. And of course, it's not just that. They also do, you know, uh, the best of uh abba or whatever abba gold but you know they've, they've got that little noise section in the corner and you know that means there's going to be all sorts of interesting stuff all over the place they also do a, like a loyalty card like cost of coffee or something um <laughs> so if you, you buy some and i'm nearly there i've got one more to go and then i get 10 pound off um oh, okay so more, more record shops should do that I think. that's good yeah, yeah, yeah i like it um and last uh, was it last time i was there this is from the noise section as it happens. This is a, a Hair Police. I don't think it's even got a title, but it's by Hair Police. I don't know if you know Hair Police, but they're yeah. um, uh, a bit like Wolf Eyes. Um, it's, a, it's I, you know, I just bought it because I thought, well, I haven't got that and it looks interesting and I like Hair Police. And apparently it dates from 2006, which is the first time I saw Hair Police uh, if I've got the years right, which was at Thurston Moore's All Tomorrow's Parties, Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh, Nightmare Before um, Christmas. This is Thurston Moore. Yeah. Ah. Um, it was a Pope oh, behind all the books. <laughs> it's the uh, one he did at All Tomorrow's Parties, Nightmare Before Christmas, Stooges, Sonic Youth. Yes, that's the one. December the 8th to the 10th. Yeah. yeah, that's it. So this dates from that tour although i didn't buy it at the time i bought it more recently um and but that festival was like sort of life-changing in a way it was amazing yeah they had iggy on they had uh you know sonic youth dinosaur junior and yeah. then they had weird stuff they had I've seen their name on there it says it yeah <laughs> yeah hair police wolf eyes were on no neck blues band uh new blockaders like really extreme noise stuff weird freak folk all sorts and that was what a weekend yeah nurse with wound dead sea played yeah that's right uh some city girls i think were on yeah but also it was an amazing lineup it was incredible it's a kind of you know apart from the big names i think we're gang of four on that year yeah um you know it's the kind of kind of bands you, you you'd only otherwise see in a kind of basement in brooklyn and thurston moore brought them all to melvin's Oh yeah, Melvin's as well. Nice. Yeah. Do you see them? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So for any like they played they played in the evening, right? And it was completely full. And then if I if you'd correct me if I'm wrong, everyone woke up the next morning with a little note under their door saying that Melvin's gonna play, play again at eleven AM because it was so full the night before. Yeah. Mental. Mental. <laughs> and the, 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 the next time I saw Hair Police was it in the Brudenell Social Club at Leeds. And it was a fiver <clears throat> to get in. Uh, and I, I had fond, fond memories of that. They, they played for like half an hour. 
just like this. And, uh, and um, I, look, I looked around at my partner, Stephanie, at one point, and she uh, surreptitiously put on like proper industrial, um, oh. you know, those ear defender things, um, you know, <laughs> without me noticing, which was amusing. Um, and I can't remember who else was on that night, but between the bands, they were they were playing the best of George Michael really loud, like in between the bands, which seemed weird. And when I went to the merch table to buy something that they were basically trying to persuade me to buy their double CD best of George Michael rather than any of their own stuff, <laughs> which, <laughs> which you don't expect from a noise band necessarily. Yeah. George Michael's all right. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah, got nothing against George Michael. It's just not what you expect to be buying at a hair, hair police merch stand. <laughs> I think uh, it's a story where George Michael crashes. Did he crash into a shop? Did driving like yeah. high or drunk crashed into a shop? Yeah. Then, uh, the next day, someone had graffitied the shop where he'd crashed into it with the word wham. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think he was listening to a Hair Police CD <laughs> on stereo like, when that happened. He's, there, he's playing Hair Police between his sets when he plays live. Yeah, yeah, oh God, yeah. I think it was uh, Matt from Pigs pick beat down records in Newcastle. That'll be it, yeah. Uh, yeah. Being his local shop. Where, where do you live then? I didn't ask that at the beginning. I live in York, which is a uh, very rock and roll. Uh, we have Vikings here and Romans uh, and Shed Seven. Um, I bet Hey Colossus have never played in York, have you? It doesn't ring a bell. They might have been off. Probably, you probably go Leeds. Uh, uh, you know, here's the thing: the last, the last, the last five times we should have played Leeds, four of which we played either Bradford or Shipley. Instead, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. off the beaten track. Mm. You should come to the Crescent. There's a nice venue called the Crescent. Um, that you'd enjoy. Is, is there maybe, a, maybe the Fulford Arms as well. Is the Fibbers? Is that is that in York? The Fibbers, Fibbers is no more, although it might be coming back. But yeah, Fibbers is like the legendary yeah. um, little venue that the Fall played like all the time and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so Newcastle from York. I don't know, like how long? What's that like? Fifty? How long does it take? Uh, about an hour. Uh, yeah. And is there any record shops in York? There, there is, yeah, there's Vinyl Eddy, um, which is has loads of stuff and everything's crammed. It's really difficult to browse because he crams everything into the crates with no like gap at the end. So you, if, if you want to browse, you have to kind of remove like six, six, seven records from the box and then you don't know what to do with those, put, put them somewhere and then you're going to have to browse and then put them back, which can't be good for the records and sleeves. Yeah. Um, and there's a nice little one called uh, Earworm Records, which is uh, a lot smaller, um, but uh, really nice guys actually in there. Uh, and you can usually find some interesting stuff as well. But you know, Newcastle is um, has mo has more to offer, I suppose, than York. We've got an HMV. <laughs> no, it's good to know though. People travel. You know, I travel around. It's good to know where the record shops are. Uh, record with memories. Uh, I've gone for, well, we've, we've kind of already touched on this, but uh, Beatles White Album. And I've gone for that because um, it reminds me of being in, uh, being on long car journeys with my mum and dad uh, and my siblings next to me. And my dad had, he, my dad had made a cassette um, which was, uh, on, on one side was the best of the police, mm. um, which I know you've, you've spoken to, was it Henry Blacker was, we're talking about the police on a previous, uh, yeah. episode, uh, you know, I, I guess that didn't really stick with me, the best of the police, but you know, it's got some bangers. Uh, and on the other side of the cassette, he, my dad had made like his own personal best of the white album. You know, because he didn't want Revolution Number no. Nine and some of the other dross. So it was like, you know, what what he thought was the, you know, the the, you know, 
it should have been a double album. What are they doing? That's really indulgent. Let's get it down to, to proper like 45 minutes or whatever it was. Um, and so like, so then I, all, you know, I, I got my own copy, like CD copy in, in my twenties or whatever. And, you know, some of the tracks are kind of ingrained into me, but I still love them. And then there were other tracks that were like completely new to me. It was like getting the deluxe <laughs> edition or the, with the outtakes or whatever. And like, like Savoy Truffle, what's that? I don't know if my dad even put Helter Skelter on his best stuff. Everybody's got something to hide except me and my monkey. What? Never heard that before. So it was like, it's like, um, yeah, it was like getting the, the deluxe, deluxe edition in your 20s, even though that, that's the proper version. And it, yeah, it just fond memories. And maybe that's where my Paul McCartney obsession comes from. I love that though. I love the cassette thing because I've said it before, but I, I used to record the albums onto a cassette for my Walkman when I was doing my paper round in the morning or whatever else, and the record would skip when I was recording it. So it would have a little jump in a song or whatever, and it would just be on the recording. And then for years, I would listen to this recording with this little jump and it'd be like, sort of thing. And then from that point on, whenever I heard the song in normal life, if it didn't have the jump or the skip, it just threw me and I couldn't work out what the hell was going on. I love the fact that, that there was a limitation to the cassette, 45 minutes. The Beatles' White Album must be, what, an hour or whatever. Way too long. Yeah, it's got some um, some dodgier ones on it, hasn't it? I, I love that first disc, though, you know. It's, it's got some amazing tracks. Yeah. That's, that's a great record. Bollocks to them. I love it. Mm. <laughs> There's a bit in the, the anthology, isn't there? The Beatles' anthology, where they're talking about whether it should be a you know, should have been a single album or they should have been, you know, editing themselves a bit better. And and Paul McCartney just kind of gives up and he goes, oh, it's the it's the bloody Beatles White Album. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah, it's the Beatles White Album. <laughs> it's not even called the White Album. Right? It's just... No, it's called the Beatles. <laughs> um, bargain for it. Or is it just, an, just, does it not have a title? Oh. Um, yeah. The Beatles. Bargain find. Bargain find. So I've gone, kind. I've kind of gone, not this was 2p and it's now worth a grand. I've gone for something that wasn't too expensive, but has uh, enriched my life stupendously, which is uh, this, Bad Moon Rising. Sonic Youth. If you look, bargain find. I don't have many CDs that still have stickers on because I'm, I'm a bit of a, a pedantic about taking them off. But it has this mid-price sticker on, which is when um, you know you go into our price or whatever, and new CDs would be what twelve ninety nine or something, and, and like back catalogue mid-price stuff you could get for what six ninety nine, eight ninety nine, something like that, a bit cheaper, and. Um, uh, why did I buy this? I, I think I got into music pr probably the week that Kurt Cobain died, I reckon. So I'm a bit, I'm a slightly too young right. uh, for Nirvana, but you know, I rem distinctly remember like the cover of NME, you know, just his black and white face, that kind of thing. I'll have been about 12, which is when you kind of suddenly, uh, go beyond the Beatles and get obsessed with mm. stuff uh, if you're that way inclined. And uh, also pe people sort of think that, you know, th there was grunge and uh, Nirvana and Kurt Cobain, and then he died. And then that was like, um, grunge stopped and we were, we were on to the next thing. And it wasn't like that, you know, the, a lot of the grunge bands carried on for a bit longer. It didn't um, just stop when she shot his head off, no. <laughs> yeah, that's what, how it's written about, though, isn't it? You know, grunge was over, then we went to The Prodigy and uh, Oasis or whatever. Um, and also, you know, he, he was like kind of became this like canonised saint type figure. And, you know, Kerrang! magazine would churn out loads of stuff about Kurt Cobain 
for years and years. Still, they still do it, you know, and stuff about whether he was murdered or you know, whatever they could get out of that. Um, and me and my friends, you know, were kind of obsessed with him. We'd have posters on our wall of Kurt Cobain, even though we weren't really into him when he was alive. <laughs> which yeah. um, I suppose you'd, you'd have a picture of Hendrix on your wall, though, wouldn't you? Um, and so this was like, you know, so you get into Nirvana and then you get into all the bands that Nirvana were, were into or that were associated mm. with Nirvana. Um, one of which obviously is Sonic Youth. Uh, and I got this one, you know, I didn't know anything about them. I, there was no way to hear them. You know, it wasn't like you could stream them for, for a bit and see if you liked it. Um, I got it because it was mid price, so it was a bit cheaper. It's quite a, uh, that's quite an entry point. Exactly. And I bought this one because it had a, had the coolest cover, I think, in the shop. You know, this crazy um, scarecrow Halloween lantern thing. Uh, and I got it home, and I did not understand it at all. It was no. the weirdest album, the weirdest thing I'd ever heard in my life. It's really slow. Um, there's like weird tunings, obviously. Um, there's like three three different singers, you know, singing on, taking it turns to to sing on a track. Um, there's they did weird vocals, um, distorted vocals, that kind of thing. Uh, Lydia Lydia Lunch pops up. Um, is this the one where that you get like the Stooges playing in the background as well? Is that on this one? But if you'd have come, if you'd have come in with goo, it would have made sense. That was the thing. Yeah, that's like the yeah. initial breakthrough, like Chuck D's on it and everything else. But yeah, you'd like okay, no, exactly. no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> well, it was, but it was completely accidental. I just didn't, I just didn't know. So I'll, I'll go go for that one. It looks cool. Um, and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't understand it at all. But I couldn't stop listening to it as well. Um, also, there was that thing back then, wasn't there? That if, you, if you'd bought a CD, you'd committed and you had to get your money's worth. So you had to listen to it and, you know, make yourself like it because you'd spent eight ninety nine 99 or whatever, which doesn't happen anymore because um, of streaming, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I became obsessed with it and then I got more, more of their stuff, you know, friendlier things like you or whatever. But uh, probably my favourite band of all time, Sonic Youth, I think. Um, yeah, and it all it all stems from that uh, mid price Bad Moon Rising. Did you ever see them? Yeah, I saw them a few times. That, that, like that. Well, yeah, that that thing. Um, I saw them on the Murray Street tour, uh, supported by Liars. That was amazing. I saw them at the Scala one year. They played at the Scala. Mm. When they when when they'd been booked into do Jules Holland and they kind of hastily arranged a gig at the same time, nice. um, and you know, I, I, incredible. I just, I just love the, you know, it's like the guitars, the different guitar sounds they have. It's like sort of electricity is r raining down or or something. I don't think they're particularly heavy necessarily, but I I, I love them. And they've, they, the other thing about them is that they, they, they really encourage fans to get their fans to get into weirder stuff as well. They're always promoting, um, you know, underground bands, yeah. you know, where, where, whether it was Nirvana when they were underground or Wolf Eyes. Um, uh, you know, it, it just it opened opened the gate to all sorts of weird music. Um, they them, them Faith No More, I think. Them and Mike Patton, they're kind of the, the gateway bands where you get into them and then suddenly you're into like free jazz or, mm. or grindcore or noise music or whatever. Well, yeah, I'd agree with that. Mike Patton was one of mine as a youngster, 15, 16. And as I'm saying, that horrible thing you held up earlier. There's a point where he, yeah, there's a point where he appears in a bat in a uh, photo thing somewhere wearing a Godflesh t-shirt. Mm. And, and I looked at that and I was like, what the hell is Godflesh? And then I found out. And, and, <laughs> and then you don't listen to, and then you <laughs> don't it listen. It was heavy. Boy, was it heavy. Yeah. And then you don't listen to Faith No More anymore. And he dug, he dug his own grave there. <laughs> like, See you later, Faith No More. <laughs> <laughs> 
I um, still listen to Faith No More. Yeah, uh, I, I've gone back to them a bit. I must admit, it's a real throwback for me. Those those albums are, yeah, they're kind of joyful. But yeah, regarding the grunge thing though, in in here, you talk quite very fondly about, in particular, this band here, Tad. Yes. Um, Which I mean, again, that's um, I don't have it to hand. The, the first one I got, it was from a uh, it was from a record shop. In, uh, in York called Track Records, which was great, but isn't there anymore. And I got the tape, uh, the cassette of Inhaler. And again, it was that kind of thing of, oh, they're, they're mates with Nirvana, so they'll probably be worth listening to. And again, I didn't like that at first. It was just too heavy for me. I thought, what's this? This is like metal. This is heavier than Metallica. You know, I, mm. I can barely listen to it. It's growly. It's really... Um, it was really weird as well, um, but then again, it grows on you. Yeah, like, I think that stuff was like it was hefty, but what helped it be hefty was its slight lack of production. Mm. Like you know, all that Metallica and all those bands, like, yeah. all, like Slayer and Metallica and all that like big metal bands, they were so produced. Like yeah. certainly as their career got on, like early on, not so much. I know, but like from the time that this stuff was happening, those bands were becoming so produced that there was a, you could tell the difference somehow. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And less reliant on kind of like widdly, widdly guitar solos and that kind of thing as well. You know, Tad, it's, it's all really driven by the riffs and the groove and the rhythm. Yeah. And, 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 and they didn't make any effort to look beautiful yeah. or anything. And, and that, like, for, for a lot of us, that, we fit quite well in with that. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's good. I don't have yeah. to, yeah. So, anyhow. Uh, so the next one I send is Bought on Tour. And I know perhaps you haven't done much touring, but I'm hoping- no, I've not done a lot of touring. No, I'm hoping you come up with a I've way around. I've a lot of things by people touring. Yeah. yeah. Um, I always have to visit the, the table and see what's going on. Uh, what, what's the one format that's better than uh, CD? Better than CD, cassette. Yeah. No, <laughs> CDR, isn't it? It's the CDR. <laughs> I love buying. Uh, so this is Super Moon um, by Magic Markers. Oh yeah, Ma Magic with a K. Um, what I like about like yeah, so bands like Hair Police, Wolf Eyes, whatever. Magic Markers are a bit more accessible now, but they were quite quite noisy at the beginning. Um, they just sound like CDR stuff. On, on their merch table for a fiver or whatever, um, and it was it, it was it was all like really weird but really interesting and worth your while. This one was actually quite a bit more expensive because it's got like it's all handmade and they've got like this. I think it, each copy's got different kind of fancy psychedelic artwork in it, um, and it, there's there's the, the CD. <laughs> um, and this was the last time I saw them, I think. I bought this um, and it's got like, it's kind of got stuff like the, they're working on before their next proper album, like they're trying out and it's got like random covers on it and things. No, no track listing on it. I had to look that up on, on Discogs to actually work out what the hell the songs were. Um, but yeah, I love Magic Markers as well. They're, Magic Markers to me are a bit like, um, it's similar to Sonic Youth in that, they're a bit like Sonic Youth if Sonic Youth with a three piece and uh, Kim Gordon sang all the songs uh, and they didn't sign to a major label. Right. Okay. No way. Yeah. Do you know Magic Markers? Yeah, 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 yeah. Did they play this? Yes, they did. Yeah, they played that. It was amazing, their set. Yeah, I can't see their name, but yeah. Yeah. Bardo Pond played that as well. Just looking at it there, like the li the lineup's incredible, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it was am amazing. Yeah. But that was the first ATP I went to as well. So, and then I like kept going for the next, well, until it ended. Uh, not not to all of them, but you know, more or less every year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they are oh, they're so good those festivals. Mm. That, one was, that one was in Somerset. <laughs> Weird. Ooh. Dinosaur Junior was so loud that my brother couldn't hear anything the next day and was really grumpy. 
there's another band you talk about, of course, Dinosaur Junior, in regards oh. to heftiness. Um, and uh, um, his uh, way of playing the guitar being so... Um, it's, it's odd. It, for me, like Dinosaur Junior is one of those bands where I'm not a big guitar solo person, but Dinosaur Junior is possibly one of the bands you can handle, right? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I, I'm not a big guitar solo person unless it's Maggot Brain uh, by Funkadelic or other Funkadelic stuff. And uh, yeah, Jay Maskis, which it, there's there's something different with it, the way he, it feels like it's coming from his soul mm. or somewhere alien. Um, uh, maybe a bit like Hendrix as well. Um, yeah, he's he's one of the guitarist that I could listen to soloing for a while and not and not think this is just showing off nonsense. Let's, what well, you let's, let's talk about guitar solos just very quickly. We buy um uh every week we'll buy the Guardian newspaper purely on a Saturday to do the crossword. We basically spend about three pounds fifty to do the crossword on a Saturday and then maybe look at the guide. One week I did look at the guide about a month ago. Talk about guitar solos and what was in the guide about a month ago. Yes, I wrote a thing for the guy, Guardian Guide about the best, trying again facetiously somewhat, determining the best guitar solo of all time. Um, I didn't have, it's only 500 words or something, maybe less. I didn't have time to talk about uh, Dinosaur Junior, which is a shame. Um, but the con in conclusion, Maggot Brain by Funkadelic. End. <laughs> it's, it's 10 minutes long. The whole thing's a guitar solo, and yet it's not rubbish. How did that happen? <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's not smooth, is it, Maggot Brain? It's like, um, you know, there are bits where it sounds like he, he's kind of going wrong a bit, and, yeah. and that, gives it, that gives it some fallibility, as you would write in your book, Joe, uh, some humanity. It's not, um, it's not. Also, um, Bardo Pond do a very good version of Maggot Brain as well, um, which you should check out. There you go. So, yeah, I, by the way, I read that whilst I was sitting on the toilet. <laughs> okay. Good to know. <laughs> Most people probably did. So, so think about that next time you're writing for that thing. Um, uh, record that people wouldn't think that you, Mr. J.R. Moores, would like. That's hard, isn't it? Because it's like, I don't really know what people would think I wouldn't if you, like. If you pulled out the Third um, Idols album, it'd be a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of Bruce Springsteen. I don't know if people would necessarily expect that. I don't like a lot of kind of bombastic um, arena filling stuff, but I love I love Bruce. Um, I think, I t you know I, know, I know people think he's like just kind of a sort of cheesy, cheesy brand puppet of the neoliberal agenda I don't know what what people make of him but I, you know I totally buy into it I think he's a good guy he's trying to good do good in the world what he stands for is nice um and a uh, few few musicians have made me cry uh, as much as Bruce Springsteen I don't know what it is um Again, it's what it's a, it's it's something that I've kind of inherited from my dad, like the Beatles. Um, it, it, you know, even even just like watching a documentary about Bruce Springsteen, I'll just start crying for some reason. It, it triggers something. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Um, that one, you know, a lot. You know, this is probably the most bombastic of a lot, but it's like it, all, all it's all about loss. It's a really sad sad album beyond the kind of uh the sparkling exterior it's, it's all about loss of kind of uh loss of friends loss of love loss of youth uh, loss loss of faith loss of faith in the american dream all that kind of stuff and I, I, yeah i love that uh so maybe that um i've got i don't know if many people have me as a fan of um lil kim um coming thinking of kind of aggressive sexuality that uh, John Doran was talking about with um, uh, uh, Betty Davis. Mm. Uh, Lil Kim's kind of in that lineage. She she was doing stuff that Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion do now, but, you know, ages ago. Uh, and then I'll just pick this up as well, which is uh, Mariah Carey's 
Christmas album, which goes on after the low one to kind of raise <laughs> raise spirits. Um, I call it, I call her Mary Carey. I sh- I, I, if if I ever met her, I'd call her Mary Carey. <laughs> you know, I, uh, what, what's it? all I want for Christmas is you is just is the best Christmas song as far as I'm concerned. Um, and you know the you know the rest of the album is good too. There we go. How's that? Would that is it? Is that expected? Unexpected? I don't know. Uh, well, like the Mary Carey is pretty unexpected. I, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so you go, well, well done for that <laughs> um the final subject i send is the favorite oh just quickly the bruce springsteen one the born in the usa song that's an anti-war yeah. song, right? it's what sorry anti-war song yes it's it's uh it's one of those ones that mis- is mistaken by americans as a kind of patriotic um uh new national anthem or something but it's a very sad song about vietnam veterans yeah. um coming home home from war or not coming home from war and feeling uh, disillusioned, disconnected and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, much like the kind of stuff that Sabbath did on yeah. Paranoid, but in a different idiom, I suppose. Yeah, like you're, you're sort of war pigs born in the USA. Yeah. <laughs> also, exactly. isn't, isn't, um, I know that everyone knows this, but What's Her Face from Friends is in the video. Is it that song? It's not that song. It's, um, <laughs> it's Dancing in the Dark. Courtney Cox is in the video, yeah. <laughs> and he, he pulls her out of the audience. She's a plant, isn't she? He pulls her out of the audience and they do like a really cheesy um, dance. Uh, even that's a sad song if you look kind of, if you think about it, I think. A lot of sadness in Springsteen. Yeah, okay. I don't want to listen to it then. Okay, um, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> the final one I send is a favourite 10 inch and your th- format yeah. thoughts. Yes. So despite all these CDs mm. on display, I do have some 10, ten inches uh, and I pulled this, I don't have many 10 inches, um, but this is uh, The End of a Beautiful Career, which is a good name uh, for your debut uh, mini album. And it's by a band called Angelica. Do you know anything about Angelica? I don't, I don't think I do. And it's a oh, nice orange, uh, what, I don't know what year it is actually. 2000, it says. Um, they were like a, uh, a, a, a an edgier Kaniki, if you can if you if you can imagine Kaniki <laughs> being any edgier than they were in the first place. Um, they were a bit like a bit like that. They were a bit like um, uh, a sort of riot girl band. Uh, in their sort of outlook, but sonically more more in the tradition of kind of uh, British indie pop or power pop, uh, with a bit of sort of noisier stuff occasionally and some recorder m- music as well. They're in the the uh, mm. the great recorder albums, <laughs> along with Gazelle Twin and other people, um, and. Yeah, they've got yeah, they've got good song titles as well. Good lyrics, good song titles. Why did you let my kitten die? Uh, I think Steve Lamarck used to play that a bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, and there's 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 a kind of, there's almost, almost sort of nursery rhyme uh, quality to it as well. Some of the sort of melodies and things, but a sort of eerie, almost creepy nursery rhyme uh, thing going on. Never and that was that was their sort of debut mini album, and then they did an album uh, afterwards, produced by uh, Kat Bjelland from Toyland, uh, Babe, Babes in in, in Toyland, Toyland. Um, and the only time I saw them was in that must have been the early two thousands as well, where Kat from Babes in Toyland had booked a European tour and not told the other members of the band. And she played with the rhythm section from Angelica instead. Uh, okay. And probably not the best tour to see, to no. see them on. But no, it doesn't... <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you know the band Porridge Radio? They remind me a bit of Angelica. Porridge Radio, I like Porridge Radio, they're... Um, I see them as the anti- to bring it full circle. 
I see them as the antidote to idols and all the laddie, shouty post punk that's going on oh, right. at the moment. I recommend them, and yeah. there's maybe a link there somewhere. No, it's good. It's good to loop it back around. I've got two questions. One, did you put those that CD shelf up behind you? Yes. Man, like you've got the confidence that it's just not going to fall down. It's. <laughs> They're secured pretty tightly with long uh, screws, uh, and it's it's not like one it's not one unit. It's like lots of little yeah. units. Um, you should see the vinyl shelf well, over there. The, the, like, it, well, it's the reason I asked is because when you were you just said I've got other ten inches. I could see your eyes looking up the wall on the other side, and I was thinking, <laughs> surely the records aren't like in a similar way. Like, the, no, no, they're not. There's more CDs over there, and there's two shelves of records, uh, which is, and there's more records in the cupboard. It's out of control. I mean, if, being a music journalist, not only are you addicted to buying records, you also get sent them for free quite often. So it's just like they're just everywhere. It must be more digital now, right? I'm, a, yeah, yeah. But if you want something, you can usually wangle a free copy. Okay. Um, and, and I'm terrible. I'm ter really bad at getting rid of stuff as well. Like I, I can't. I can't part with, you know, any any eagle-eyed viewers with a magnifying glass might be able to pick at stuff out of there and go, why has he got that? I, I even removed some red hot chili peppers before we started because I didn't want anyone to see. But I, you know, I never listen to them, and um, I mean about them in the book. But I just can't get rid of. I can't get rid of stuff yet. Maybe, maybe in, in time I'll. I'll be less. Yeah, you you, you, you ask about rec, you know memories, records of memories. They all have memories, don't they? And you never know when you might need to uh, uh, access those memories. Well, there's always like you know three in the morning, Californication comes on. <laughs> <laughs> scar tissue. I just really need to hear scar tissue. <laughs> so it's been really good talking. Thank you for having me on. It's it's an honour. Uh, well, well um, and people need to tuck into this book. So it's out September. I'm not. This isn't this this YouTube thing I'm doing. I'm really not into like promoting shit. Like people coming on and talking about their crap. I don't really care. But um, I do think this book's good. Um, Thank you. And it, but I, th it, I think this book's good. <laughs> um, it could easily be three times as long. I'll say that for it. Um, but but I can see why it couldn't be because it's already, well, including all the references at the end, it's not far off 500 pages long. <laughs> so, um, and like you read, there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, albums that you suggest that perhaps people need to check out. Um, I don't know, it's a good book. So there you go. Thank you, Joe. Um, and thanks for, thanks for coming on and talking. We're going to wave goodbye. Okay. okay. And then yes. once we've waved goodbye, I'll stop it. And then we can say goodbye properly. And properly slag off everyone. <laughs> <laughs> stopped recording. Wave goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.